Hello, and welcome to our educational webinar, Managing and Treating Canine Cushing's Disease, presented by Decra Veterinary Products and Henry Schein Animal Health. Everyone in attendance today is eligible to receive one and a half continuing education hours. In order to get your CEs, you will need to complete the survey at the end of this 90-minute presentation. You can expect to receive your certificate via email in about two weeks from today. We welcome your questions during the presentation. Please use the questions pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. We will pause midway through the presentation to answer the first round of questions, and then we'll close the presentation with all remaining questions. We're very pleased to have Dr. Kathleen Engler with us today to present this webinar. Dr. Engler received her veterinary degree from the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine in 1991. Following graduation, she worked as a small animal clinician in a progressive general practice in Federal Way, Washington for five years before joining a national practice in 1996. Dr. Engler became a diplomate of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners in 2001 and recertified in 2011. During her 18-year career with the national practice, she was a practicing clinician and chief of staff in the greater Seattle area. She was a medical advisor consulting with doctors across the country and on ongoing cases and reviewing adverse case outcomes, as well as building medical education for the practice. She served on the Medical Standards Board. She held the position of Senior Director of Veterinary Career Development, building veterinary onboarding and development programs, and supported the Oregon Southwest Washington market of 14 to 26 hospitals as the Medical Director for six years. Dr. Engler joined DECRA in September 2014 as a field-based technical services veterinarian for the West. Welcome, Dr. Engler. Thank you, Amy, and thank you all for taking the time from your busy day to join us here. It's going to do it again. I don't know what it is, Amy, but every time we switch around, okay, there it goes. All right, so uh, today we're briefly going to review the pathophysiology, clinical signs, and how to diagnose Cushing's disease in dogs. We're going to take a short break, then allow the group to ask questions, as Amy noted, and then we'll move on to discuss treatment, monitoring, and using Veterol, and finish with some common questions and utilizing cases to demonstrate some decision-making points when it comes to using Veterol. We're going to start with pathophysiology. The symptoms of Cushing's are the result of excessive uh, chronic production of circulating glucocorticoids by the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are paired glands that lie just cranial to the kidneys, and each adrenal gland is divided into two functionally distinct parts, the medulla and cortex. The medulla comprises 10 to 20 percent of the adrenal gland and produces the fight or flight hormones, catecholamines. The cortex comprises 80 to 90 percent and converts cholesterol into the androgens or the precursors of sex hormones, mineral corticoids that are responsible for maintaining electrolyte balance, and glucocorticoids. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis is key to understanding how we diagnose Cushing's disease. In a normal dog, cortisol is released by the adrenal gland in response to stress. A classic negative feedback loop operates to regulate endogenous production. The, hypothalamic produces, uh, the hypothalamus produces the corticotropin-releasing hormone, which regulates the anterior pituitary to produce adrenal cortico hormone, ACTH, and ACTH attaches to the receptors in the adrenal cortex, stimulating production of cortisol. Both cortisol and ACTH act on the higher centers to stop production of CRH and ACTH. In patients with tumors of, of the anterior pituitary, the tumor produces ACTH independent of CRH activity. There is constant production of ACTH with little to no feedback response, and thus both, and thus both adrenal cortex are commonly, consistently stimulated to produce excess corticosteroids, and thus bilateral adrenal cortex or cortical hyperplasia occurs. Patients with tumors of the adrenal gland that are producing cortisol independent of ACTH activity do assert negative feedback to the higher centers, effectively turning off ACTH production. With the downregulation, the contralateral adrenal gland no longer receives stimulation from the ACTH for cortisol production, and adrenal atrophy occurs in this contralateral gland. Therapeutically, corticosteroids are used in massive doses relative to physiological levels. Dogs who receive prolonged oral, injectable, or topical corticosteroids also induce a negative feedback to the higher centers, and ACTH production is stopped. Thus, bilateral adrenal atrophy occurs. It may take months for the hypothalamic pituitary axis to return to normal function after these drugs are stopped. 
Well, we, we will revisit the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis when we discuss hormonal assays for the diagnosis of Cushing's disease. Hyperadrenal corticism can be spontaneous or iatrogenic. The spontaneous cases are associated with a tumor in either the pituitary gland or the adrenal gland. 80 to 85 percent of cases are due to pituitary tumors and only 15 to 20 percent are due to adrenal tumors. Of the pituitary tumors, 80 to 85 percent are microadenomas and 20 to 20 percent are macroadenomas or masses that are greater than one centimeter. And these are prone to actually neurological signs. Adrenal tumors, you can flip a coin and about 50 percent are malignant and 50 percent are benign. It's important to know where the tumor is, adrenal versus pituitary, in order to determine the proper treatment and offer the pet owner the proper diagnosis to predict the type of clinical signs to monitor for. Iatrogenic Cushing's results from prolonged exogenous corticosteroid administration from topical, oral, or injectable sources. And then there's also a food-induced, uh, which in some individuals of people, and it has been diagnosed in dogs, one of the hormones released during eating um, is actually structurally similar to ACTH, such that it attaches to the ACTH receptors in the adrenal cortex, causing production of cortisol. And then we have atypical Cushing's, also known as alopecia X, and some Pomeranian breeders do refer to this as black skin disease. This diagnosis is controversial and exact etiology is unclear, but new information emerges periodically in the literature. Patients display clinical signs that are highly suggestive of Cushing's, but they have normal urine cortisol creatinine, ACTH, and low-dose dexamethasone suppression test results. In some of these patients, measurements of sex hormones can be considered, as 17-hydroxyprogesterone and 17-beta-estradiol are believed to a play a role in some patients. Consulting with the endocrinology lab at the University of Tennessee, um, by sending samples um, that are submitted after the sex or after an ACTH stim to look for pre and post levels of those hormones. One of the reasons atypical Cushing's appears to be difficult to pin down is that the underlying etiology may differ between different breeds. Some suggest that the low dose dex normals should be readjusted to, do, to ranges being too high to diagnose Cushing's in our early cases, and some labs have already dropped these values. Thus, some early Cushing cases may move from atypical to typical Cushing's category. If other differentials have been ruled out, whatever the underlying etiology is, though, these patients actually may spawn, respond to the treatment for Cushing's disease. In the meantime, a nice sweater may be indicated for them. Now that we have diagnosed the, or we have discussed the basic pathophysiology of Cushing, let's discuss clinical signs associated with the disease. Excessive cortisol in the body is responsible for the clinical signs associated with Cushing's. The reason so many different signs are noted is because corticosteroids have so many diverse effects on the body, maybe more so than any other hormone. Cortisol acts to maintain blood glucose concentrations by increasing production of glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. Protein and fat catabolism are stimulated to provide amino and fatty acids for this process. Cortisol also counteracts the effects of insulin. The catabolic actions of glucocorticoids on proteins result in muscle wasting and weakness, and they also result in the increased formation of hepatic gluconeogenic enzymes, which act on amino acids to produce glucose. Thus, we can see hyperglycemia in Cushing's, in Cushing's patients, and sometimes they go on to develop diabetes. The catabolic actions on fat stores are, con are countered by insulin, which inhibits lipolysis and stimulates lipogenesis. As a result, adipose tissue tends to be redistributed to the abdomen and back, neck, and back of the neck in dogs with excessive concentrations of glucocorticoids. And the list goes on and on. Clinical signs associated with Cushing's are not immediately life-threatening. However, they do cause a decline in quality of life for the pet and the owner. Owners can easily get frustrated with their dog who's constantly urinating, oftentimes in the house, or who is constantly panting and maybe disturbing the owner's sleep. The clinical signs seen with Cushing's get worse if treatment does, is not done. Owners may not immediately report these clinical signs as something wrong with their pet. They often assume the signs are just due to old age. After all, many people start to slow down, start to develop pot bellies, and have thinning hair as they age. If a client brings in their dog for a checkup and reports the dog is fine, just getting old, it may be very helpful to ask the client, well, tell me more about what you mean by getting old. What are you seeing? Cushing's is rarely seen in dogs less than six years of age. We only have one dog in our database that I'm aware of that is less than six years of age, and this was a five-year-old dog owned by a veterinarian. 
Males and females are equally represented as well as many breeds, although there are some breeds that appear to have increased predilection. Please remember Cushing's is a clinical diagnosis. If a lab work uh, says Cushing's but the dog has no symptoms, do not treat. We will be monitoring a response to therapy based on improvement or resolution of clinical signs. If we don't have clinical signs, then monitoring is difficult to impossible. As a clinical diagnosis, it all starts in the exam room. Hyperadrenal cortisism is caused by excessive secretion of cortisol from the adrenal glands, and the classic signs of Cushing's are due to chronic effects of excessive levels of cortisol in the body. Polyuria, defined as greater than 50 mils per kilogram per day, and polydipsia, defined as a greater than 100 mils per kilogram per day, lead to dilute urine concentrations, typically less than 1020, with a large percentage being reported less than 1015. Thinning of hair coat, polyphagia, in some cases it's severe enough that a pet might even jump through the ring of fire to get to their food, um, are often noted by the owners. Additionally, panting, lethargy, weakness, and chronic infections of both the skin and urinary tract are reported and of concern to owners. The alopecia is usually bilaterally symmetrical, mainly on the trunk and spares the head and legs. It is non-puretic, topically uh, or typically, unless there's a secondary pyoderma. A pot-bellied appearance due to the weakness of the abdominal muscles and accumulation of fat within the abdomen can often be observed. Thinning and or an elasticity of the skin, especially on the ventrum, are often found on physical examination. Calcis nosus cutis is depicted on the lower left-hand picture. Uh, the lesions are often thick and hard, raised plaques on the surface of the skin. Um, this sign is almost pathognomonic, but it can also be seen in uh, cases of renal failure, but it is rare. Um, it will not likely improve with treatment due to the severity of the skin damage that occurs with the calcification. Um, why it can occur in spontaneous Cushing's disease, uh, the first thing you want to do is actually rule out, uh, rule out iatrogenic Cushing's if you see this. Poor wound healing or uh, post-injury or surgery may be observed as well as poor regrowth of hair after shaving. And there are patients who will only have skin or coat changes with no symptoms associated with um, their Cushing's disease. So let's take a look at a real case, Princess, who is a 13-year-old 9-pound Maltese. She has a history of chronic recurrent skin problems that have in the past responded to typical antimicrobial and corticosteroid therapy. But this year she has developed a facial pruritus that hasn't responded to treatment. On physical exam, she was found to have a thinning hair coat. She appeared to be pot-bellied. Skin changes included reduced elasticity and papules, pustules, and epidermal collarettes. Skin scraping revealed demodectic mites. Demodex is normally diagnosed in dogs less than one year of age. If present in a middle age or older dog, we have to question what else is going on with the dog that has allowed the Demodex to occur. Sometimes dogs with recurring urinary tract infections or recurring skin infections may have Cushing syndromes as the underlying problem as well. This is due to the immunosuppression that is occurring from the excessive release of glucocorticoids. If the first episode of pyoderma or urinary tract infection occurs in an older dog, this is not typical. We usually see skin infections and the diagnosis of allergies or atopy occur in dogs typically between two and six years of age. We should question what has suddenly changed in this dog that he is now getting these infections that, have never, that he's never had before. Clinical signs can be any combination. Not all, are, not all are present in every patient, but they are all due to, 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 the, to the effects of excessive corticosteroids. Some patients will also be found to have hypertension, which is not well controlled with medications until the hyperadrenal corticism is under control. Additionally, some patients may have complex, uh, a complex hypercoagulability that predisposes the patient to development of pulmonary thromboemboli. Placing pets on anticoagulants, therefore, may be necessary. Proteinuria may be also found on urinalysis in some of these patients. Given that Cushing's disease is a clinical diagnosis, we also should consider that signs that are unlikely to occur in, in Cushionoid patients. Because of the polyphagia, some patients will develop garbage gut leading to vomiting or diarrhea and potentially pancreatitis, but excess cortisol in and of itself doesn't lead to these disorders. Rarely, dogs with pituitary macroadenomas will actually have poor appetites because of the large size tumor versus the ravenous behavior of most of the cushionoid dogs. But having a poor appetite is unlikely in most of our patients. <clears throat> 
Additionally, because glucocorticoids control inflammation, they also help manage pain. You're unlikely to see seizures or bleeding disorders, and while hyperadrenocortisone dogs um, can develop protein-losing nephropathies, and we may be able to measure decreasing GFR over time, they rarely develop overt renal failure. Now that we've looked at the pathophysiology and clinical picture, let's take a look at some of the tests and numbers that we can use to support our diagnosis. The following clinical pathology changes may or may not occur with a hyperadrenal cortisone patient. An increased hematocrit and thrombocytosis may be present, with sometimes that platelet count being well over 600,000. Neutrophilia with, without a left shift and monocytosis are secondary to demargination from the capillaries. Lymphopenia is from lympholysis. Eosinopenia is due to sequestration, and if you see eosinophilia, consider looking for an another differential for your clinical signs. Hyperglycemia is likely due to insulin resistance. Increased ALKFOS, cholesterol, and triglycerides are, are common, but please remember there are lots of disease processes that, that can increase these as well. When I was consulting on cases, I would frequently be asked about patients with elevated ALKFOS and what, what tests should be run to look for Cushing's disease. Again, if there were no clinical signs consistent with Cushing's disease, then it should not be tested for. In my experience, ALKFOS elevations are common in older dogs with the dental disease, and simply cleaning the teeth and following up with a short course of antibiotics will quite often resolve the ALKFOS elevations. Vet record from January 2015 reported a vet retrospective study, a case study which found in dogs with Cushing's that had hyperphosphatemia that this was considered a negative prognostic indicator as these dogs had shorter survival times. Low urine specific gravities are often seen as we mentioned earlier. They can have glucose urea or protein urea, but not all dogs have that low specific gravity. And urinary tract infections are common, but can be occult, and so you may need a culture and sensitivity to diagnose. This slide covers the three most common tests that veterinarians will run to help confirm the diagnosis of Cushing's once they have a specician based on clinical signs, client observations at home, and preliminary results um, on the chemistry, CBC, and urinalysis. While it would be nice to have a simple SNAP test that had a blue dot developed to tell us that the dog had Cushing's, we're not fortunate enough nor likely will we ever be to actually have this test. So we are left to figure out which of the tests should be utilized and how to interpret the results of the urine cortisol creatinine low dose dexamethasone suppression test and or the ACTH stimulation test. Many of us have struggled with which test to use first and which is best for the diagnosis of Cushing's. In the past, I would attend lectures where one specialist would suggest the ACTH stem uh, was best and why, and then the very next lecture, another would utilize the low-dose dex. In 2012, the ACVI and 4M did get together and publish a consensus statement to provide more consistent guidelines for us, and we will look at each of the pros and cons associated with these tests. I will reiterate again, though, that these tests should not be considered unless there are clinical signs consistent with Cushing's disease. In fact, one of the first statements from the consensus statement is, the primary indication for pursuing a diagnosis of hyperadrenal corticism is the presence of one or more of the common clinical signs and physical exam findings. It goes on to state, regardless of the test used, a high degree of clinical suspicion is mandatory to avoid false positive results. The diagnosis of hyperadrenal corticism depends on demonstrating two principal characteristics. First, increased cortisol production, and second, decreased sensitivity to glucocorticoid feedback. For the most accurate cortisol evaluation, the panel did make a recommendation that plasma or serum samples for cortisol measurement should be centrifuged within one hour after collection, frozen immediately at minus 20 degrees Celsius, and then sent to the lab for overnight submission to a reference laboratory. Urine samples can be stored at 4 degrees Celsius or frozen until shipment to the lab, and they, use, and they do not have to be um, packed with ice overnight or when they're shipped. The urine cortisol creatinine ratio is a simple, relatively inexpensive test, but it is prone to false positives. Not all dogs who have elevated cortisol in their urine have Cushing's. Creatinine is excreted in the urine at a constant rate, but cortisol is not. It is imperative that the dog is not stressed for the urine sample collection, so the owner should collect the sample at home and bring it to the practice. Wait at least 48 hours after the hospital visit, and then the client can collect one to three days' worth of urine and pool it to increase the chances of observing an elevated cortisol due to daily variation. The test is inexpensive, and the dog does not have to come to the clinic, and that's what I liked about it as a general practitioner. 
Stress and non-adrenal illness can cause increase in urine cortisol levels, therefore false positives will occur. Specificities is actually as low as 20 to 25 percent. However, normal ratio can be considered truly negative and Cushing's can be rolled out. And again, I like this because if it came back negative, I knew I didn't need to jump into the other two tests because I was not pursuing Cushing's as my diagnosis any longer. The 2012 consensus statement concluded that the urine cortisol creatinine is a very sensitive test to detecting cortisol. and elevated cortisol secretion. Therefore, a high urine cortisol creatinine in dogs um, that did not have a high degree of clinical suspicion of hyperadrenal corticism should be interpreted cautiously. And basically they're saying there are lots of false positives from non-adrenal disease. So positives don't mean much. It's the negatives that help rule it out. With a low-dose DEX, we're adding cortisol in the form of dexamethasone to the system to test the regulatory mechanisms. Essentially, we're looking for is the negative feedback system intact, causing the suppression of CRH and ACTH, and thus cortisol at the four and eight-hour marks. A normal dog will actually suppress cortisol production within two to three hours and remain suppressed for 16 to 24 hours or more. The low-dose DEX suppression test has a high sensitivity, somewhere between 80 and 100 percent, so a negative provides a high degree of confidence the dog is normal. Like the urine cortisol creatinine ratio, though, the low-dose DEX is also prone to lots of false positive results. Any form of non-adrenal disease or, actual, or Cushing's can cause the test to be positive. Thus, the low-dose DEX has a low specificity, so a positive is not confirmatory for hyperadrenal corticism. 27 to actually up to 66% of dogs will be false positives as a result of non-adrenal illness. Low-dose dexamethasone can help differentiate, though, the pituitary dependent from the adrenal tumors if there's at least a 50% suppression at that four-hour mark. The test should not be used if the patient has a history of exogenous steroid administration. So how we do the test is IV dexamethasone is administered after baseline blood sample is obtained. Um, you note if, the, if you are using the, the salt formulation, the DEX, the DEX SP formulation, it only has three milligrams per mil of active dexamethasone, and so you need to calculate your, your dose off of that. You can select, yeah, select samples, um, again, at the four and eight hours, and positive patients will have an eight-hour cortisol level of greater than 1.45 micrograms per deciliter. Oh, just real quick, in 2012, the AC, um, ACVIM consensus panel did consider this low-dose DEX test as a screening test of choice, unless you have iatrogenic Cushing's as a possibility. And the reason for that is because it's the one test that's not only highly sensitive, but also has the possibility to differentiate pituitary-based tumors versus adrenal-based tumors. Please also be aware that because normal dogs tend to have cortisol concentrations below or very close to the, to the detectable limits of this current assay, that they are looking at new cutoff values being established and several laboratories have changed those standards. ACTH stimulation test is the test um, or is testing for adrenal cortical reserve. Dogs with enlarged adrenal tissue have exaggerated cortical, uh, cortical response or cortisol response to the ACTH. To perform this test, we will utilize the synthetic ACTH compound. Uh, cositropin is a synthetic ACTH made up of the first 24 of 39 amino acids of the natural ACTH. It has the same activity as natural ACTH, causing secretion of cortisol from the adrenal cortex. It typically comes in 250 microgram vials, um, and the FDA has uh, several approved products that can be used interchangeably in pets. But please note that the gels are not preferred and are con and currently only available compounded. Uh, and key op opinion leaders discourage their use because they end up with variable results. All dogs should have a rise in cortisol release as a response to ACTH, but it tends to be exaggerated, however, in our Cushing's cases due to the increased amount of adrenal tissue present, either from bilateral adrenal or hypertrophy, um, as seen in the pituitary dependence, or because you have a large adrenal tumor. With ACTH stimulation, there is considerable overlap between your Cushing's and normal patients, and some dogs with Cushing's will have normal results or false negatives, um, and some normal dogs will actually have exaggerated responses consistent with Cushing's, so that's why the low-dose uh, DEX is preferred over the ACTH stim by the panel. <laughs> 
ACTH STEM is the gold standard for diagnosis of iatrogenic Cushing's. The basics of the test is to administer a 5 microgram per kilogram uh, synthetic ACTH IV with a maximum dose of 250 micrograms for one vial. In 2014, ACVM did have a presentation on a 1 microgram per kilogram protocol, and it's not at this point considered the standard, but you can find further information on the 2014 ACVIM proceedings. Peak cortisol excretions occur between 60 and 90 minutes after injection, therefore a second blood sample collected one hour post-ACTH administration, and positive Cushing cases are greater than 22 uh, micrograms per deciliter. The response from iatrogenic Cushing patients is very distinct. It's essentially a flat line due to the adrenal atrophy caused by prolonged steroid administration having stopped production of ACTH from the higher centers. On a side note, because we are no longer using an entire vial of ACTH stimulation test, there is a corsotropin freezing protocol available, and you may call the DECRA technical support team for further information on this. So what about our case princess? That was the 9-pound, 13-year-old Maltese. Well, her CVC was actually normal. Her serum chemistry panel showed a marked elevation in ALKFOS and GGT, along with a low total T4. A full thyroid panel, though, uh, we did reveal that the free T4 and TSH concentrations uh, to be normal, and thus we diagnosed a sick thyroid syndrome. An ACTH was performed, um, and post-stimulation cortisol value was 47.3, and a diagnosis of Cushing's was made. Once we have a diagnosis of Cushing's based on clinical signs, physical exam findings, and supportive laboratory uh, data, it's then time to differentiate between adrenal and pituitary-based disease when we have uh, spontaneous Cushing's. The low-dose DEX will help us just di differentiate between these two in about 60% of cases um, because the pituitary dependence uh, can suppress up to 50% uh, or if they do suppress up to 50% at the base from baseline um, at the four-hour mark, it tells us we have a pituitary-based tumor. But if there's no suppression, uh, then we need to select a, di a secondary test because um, some of our, about 25% of our pituitary dependent fail to suppress at all, and very rarely and the adrenal tumors do not. The high-dose DEX suppression test uh, used to be the secondary test we reached for, but given the availability of imaging, the test is no longer recommended by the ACVIM consensus panel. It's only recommended when the ultrasound or endogenous ACTH are not available, um, as it only actually provides differentiation in about 12% of cases, so it doesn't add a lot of data for us. So when we take a look at imaging, radiographs can actually help kind of complete the picture for us. You can see abdominal distension, good contrast due to abdominal fat deposition, hepatomegaly, and distended bladder may be seen. If you actually see a small liver, that makes hyperadrenal cortisism unlikely. 50% of adrenal tumors were found to be calcified in actually one study. Uh, dermal and subcutaneous dystrophic calcification may be visualized in areas of predilection for calcinosis cutis. Ultrasounds can show symmetrical or mildly asymmetrical um, normal-sized or enlarged adrenal glands um, with your pituitary-based tumors, and, and asymmetry or atrophy of the contralateral adrenal cortex and or destruction of normal tissue architecture are consistent with adrenal tumors. And then CT or MRI can be used to image pituitary and adrenal glands. Endogenous ACTH measurement is the most accurate standalone biochemical differentiating test for diagnosed pituitary dependent from adrenal tumors. Proper sample handling is critical though, so please call your laboratory to discuss. And in Princess, we uh, actually did an ultrasound on her abdomen, and we found that she had bilaterally enlarged adrenal glands, and so she was diagnosed with a pituitary-based uh, tumor. So this is a good time that we can uh, take a quick break and ask if there are any questions associated with the clinical signs or diagnosing hyperadrenal corticism. All right. Thank you, Dr. Engler. Um, we just have a few questions at this midpoint. Um, Nancy wants to know, how common is Cushing's in cats? It's not overly common, but it is seen. Uh, I don't have an actual percentage for you. Um, Kathy would like to know, I've always used the ACTH stim test to diagnose Cushing's. Why do you recommend the low-dose DEX test? 
Um, the low-dose DEX test is recommended because it is more sensitive, uh, meaning that you can have more faith if it's a negative test that you've ruled out Cushing syndrome. We do have to worry that you can get some false positives, um, but it is the one test out of the three that can help us differentiate between an adrenal tumor and a pituitary tumor, and it does that about 60% of the time, so we don't have to reach for another secondary test. Uh, Stephanie would like to know, can you go over the recommendations regarding freezing of lab samples for LDDS? Um, I, what I would actually do is refer you to the ACVM consensus statement that goes through more of the, um, the details around those tests, and you can actually get to that from uh, typing in ACVIM consensus statement on your online search engine and find it. Um, or if you call our tech services team, we'd be more than happy to send that out to you or, or talk further through the cases. Um, Karen is curious, are some breeds more apt to get Cushing's than others? There do seem to be some breed predilection. You can see it in, uh, in pretty much any breed, but you know we do tend to see it in dachshunds, beagles, boxers, labs. Um, you know, tend to be some of the breeds that have a higher predilection than others, but it has, is seen in, in essentially any breed. Okay, great. Um, those are all the questions we have for right now. Shall we get into the second half? Sure. So let's move on to treating and monitoring. Many dogs are euthanized because of the clinical signs, urinating in the house, panting all the time, etc. Treatment will help prevent euthanasia due to these clinical signs that interrupt the human-animal bond. Treatment decreases the risk of skin and urinary infections, including the kidneys, um, and diabetes, and we improve the chances of resolving high blood pressure and proteinuria, which can have deleterious effects all on their own. If the uh, treatment for Cushing's does not resolve the hypertension and or proteinuria, additional medications can be used to control them. These medications are more likely to be effective when the cortisol is being controlled too. So what available treatment options are there for hyperadrenal corticism? Well, depending on the case, surgery, medical therapy, or radiation therapy can be considered. Adrenalectomy is the treatment of choice in cases with confirmed tumors with no local invasion and with no evidence of distant metastasis who, um, are, who are stable otherwise. It is recommended to treat with Federal four to eight hours prior to surgery, to st or four to, six, four to eight weeks prior to surgery to stabilize and improve surgical outcomes. Hypophysectomies are the treatment of choice for people with pituitary dependent um, tumors, but it's not widely available for dogs at this time. Uh, there are a few places, though, that are performing them. Washington State College of Veterinary Medicine has a surgeon. Utrecht is uh, pretty much the leader in this area. Uh, one hospital in New York and in Southern California also are, are performing these. Uh, the cost is relatively high, somewhere in the $8,000 mark, and the cases do have to be selected carefully, uh, but many of them are having positive long-term outcomes. Radiation is gaining acceptance as an alternative to surgery for pituitary tumors, um, and there are a lot of really good outcomes associated with two and three years uh, year survival studies so that are um, equal to hypophysectomies, so some good data coming out there. There are some med medical options, but Veteral is the only FDA-approved drug for the treatment of both pituitary and adrenal-dependent uh, hyperadrenal corticism. It's a short-acting and reversible enzyme inhibitor. It's uh, safer to handle than mitotain and not hepatotoxic or nephrotoxic. And this, uh, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time on, or the rest of our time in the presentation discussing. Um, but let's uh, just mention very shortly Anapril. It is approved for um, uncomplicated pituitary-dependent tumors. Um, it increases dopamine concentration, which downregulates ACTH concentration. Efficacy is fairly, fairly low, though, with only 10 to 15 percent of patients showing resolution of clinical signs. Mitotain is not approved for use in dogs. It's a human, human cytotoxic chemotherapy chemotherapeutic or anti-neoplastic drug. It actually works by causing cellular death through the adrenal gland. Um, interesting to note that its half-life in people is actually 18 to 159 days per the product insert, so it has some very variable pharmacokinetics in people. So, And we don't really have any pharmacokinetic studies in dogs to look at. Uh, ketoconazole has been used in the past. It is an option. It's a common fungi, uh, fungi uh, 
antifungal medication. Um, it blocks several of the P450 enzyme systems, thus effectively blocking the synthesis of glucocorticoids and androgens. It has neg negligible effects on mineralocorticoids, but it's effective only in about 50% of cases, and it's not really considered the standard of care in the United States. So Veteral is available in four strengths to treat a variety of patients. So we have the 10 milligram, the 30 milligram, the 60, and the 120. And it's available through your normal veterinary distributors. We're also um, excited to announce that FDA finally approved our 5 milligram capsule. And we're currently um, having the plan to have this available to your distributors by late fall. So let's all have a big shout out and a yay there. Trilostane is principally a reversible um, inhibitor of the enzyme of the 3-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, thus blocking the production of cortisol, and to a lesser extent, aldosterone or mineralocorticoids in the sex hormones. The effect only lasts as long as the half-life of the drug, so if oversuppression of the other hormones occurs, especially aldosterone, you can simply discontinue Veteral and allow the hormone production to return to normal and then make a clinical decision about restarting Veteral at a lower dose or potentially discontinuing its use if clinical symptoms of Cushing's uh, does not return. Any effect on aldosterone production is likely to be clinically insignificant at the dose required to control cortisol. You might want to, uh, Amy, you might want to mute your line there. Amy, you might want to mute your line because we're getting feedback from you. Thank you. All right. So maximal suppression of cortisol production occurs at three to eight hours post-bill. ACTH stimulation tests should be performed four to six hours post-bill. For proper assessment, if the test is done too early or too late, the cortisol levels will be higher than at the four to six hours, and the doctor may make inappropriate dosage change. If the owner did not give the pill that morning or if they did not give it with food, you need to reschedule the ACTH stim and instruct the owner to administer it properly. This is also the reason we want Veteral to be administered in the morning. If the owner gives it at night, you can't run the ACTH, ACTH stim test during normal office hours. Based on this curve, you would think that dogs would need to be on a twice-daily veteral therapy, but we know from our FDA clinical trials as well as on uh, ongoing monitoring post-launch that four out of five dogs have their clinical signs controlled with once-daily therapy. There are about 20% of the patients who will need twice-daily therapy to control their clinical signs. Based on this curve, though, you, you will hear some specialists recommend starting all dogs on twice-daily therapy. Veteral is approved for once or twice daily therapy, so this is not off-label use, but keep in mind that many of our clients will have difficulty in complying with twice daily therapy consistently long-term wise. The approved dose for Veteral is at a range of one to three milligrams per pound. Always start low, one milligram per pound or lower if you are concerned. Uh, there is individual variation in patient response to Veteral, so inform the owner that we will have some dose adjustments until the optimal dose is identified. If the calculated patient dose falls between currently available strengths, round the patient or patient's dose down. Initially, monitor, mo administer the Veteral once a day in the morning with food, as trilostane and its active metabolite ketotrilostane are three times better absorbed when given with food. Unlike lysodrine, there is no induction or loading phase. Close monitoring is essential when a patient is initially started on Veteral. If the owner notices any changes or abnormalities, they should call the veterinarian immediately. The first recheck should be, recheck should be done in 10 to 14 days, sooner if, a concern, if the owner has concerns or there are problems. The owner should be questioned about improvement of clinical signs. In fact, that's the most important question to ask them during this recheck is what's happening with water intake, appetite, urination, and panting. The initial blood work should be included in the ACTH stim test as, um, at the four to six hours post pill and a chemistry panel with electrolytes. Cortisol levels drop precipitously in the first 10 to 14 days and they will continue to drop over the next several weeks, but not as dramatically. So the, so the initial monitoring uh, should not be done for dose uh, increases or only use it for to discover if the actual pet is, or the dose is too high and the patient is being oversuppressed. Our target range for ACTH stim is between 1.5 and, and 9.1. Patients may not quite be in this range at the two-week check, but um, should be trending toward it, and the owner should report improvement in clinical signs. If the re results show a cortisol level at or below the lower end of our range, we want to decrease the veteral dose. 
Assuming all post-cortisol levels are appropriate and no dose adjustments are made, um, a second ACTH stim is done at four weeks from the initiation of therapy, then at 12 weeks and every three months thereafter. Any time a dose adjustment is made, a recheck with ACTH stim should be performed at the 10 to 14 days um, as, uh, as, as was the initial monitoring. The resolution of clinical signs of Cushing's is the goal of our therapy. We're not chasing numbers. Ensure the owners um, report improvement. Um, sometimes our range um, does come in above 9.1, but if the dog is doing great, we don't want to increase our dose. Again, we're not chasing a number. We're looking at resolution of clinical signs. Decker can provide you with treatment and monitoring algorithm to help you make decisions along the way, and you may utilize our technical support team. Uh, we're really uh, love to answer your questions and help you make some decisions around those cases. So what do you expect to see um, as far as regards to your clinical science? How quickly do they improve? We know from our FDA trials that we usually within the first two weeks you see a 40% to 50% improvement and the owner should see, um, have, should have seen that the dog is drinking and urinating less, the animal should be less ravenous and excessive panting should be reduced. Lethargy is another clinical sign of Cushing syndrome that, have rap uh, that, uh, that rapidly responds to treatment that even in that first 10 to 14 days owners um, have noticed that their dog has more energy and is almost like a puppy again. Usually by the 12-week mark, you'll notice an abdominal girth reduction, so the pot belly appearance it seems to be diminishing. They have increased muscle tone and strength. Some hair regrowth may be noticeable, but hair loss actually may worsen initially um, as the large amounts of the hair can be in the telogen growth phase or shed. By six months, uh, most clinical signs of Cushing syndrome should have improved or resolved, and at the end of our six-month clinical trial of 60 dogs, no more than 15% of dogs exhibited any of the clinical signs associated with Cushing syndrome. Do keep in mind, though, if urination does not improve, uh, remember to rule out a urinary tract infection as the cause, as that uh, polyuria can be due from other reasons than Cushing's. There are photographs of, of dogs at three stages, um, at three months of treatment, um, and six months, and then nine months. Um, and you can see that the hair growth is one of the last things to improve. So we need to make sure that owners understand that. As, as I mentioned, the hair coat can actually look worse initially before we start seeing hair growth coming back in. And sometimes clients can be a little bit uh, anxious to see that happening and, and calling you if, you if you don't pre warn them that it may take a good six to nine months before they see a lot of good hair growth. So what happened in our case, Princess? She was started on 10 milligrams, which is just above the 1 milligram per pound dose of Vedral once a day in the morning with food. She returned two weeks later with the owner reporting improvement in her clinical signs and ACTH stem test, along with her campenil and electrolytes um, and were performed. Uh, while the ACTH stem was not quite within our normal range, it did make significant improvement. When the improvement in clinical signs and trending of the ACTH stem, she was left at her current dose and a recheck um, two weeks later or four weeks after that initiation of therapy, and then again at three months with significant improvement. And by 90 days, her Demodex was resolved and new hair uh, was starting to grow. Unfortunately, though, the clients decided to discontinue the therapy uh, when they went off for vacation. And within 30 days of stopping the medication, her skin condition returned, and we had to start all over again. The bottom line is that we have to remember that clients sometimes think we have cured the problem once the pet's looking better and forget that medications need to be continued lifelong. It's a really good opportunity to utilize, utilize client brochures and DECRA does have a new client education brochure that goes through a pretty detailed explanation of the disease that we can provide for you to fully educate your owners on this disease. Also utilize your team to communicate with the client on a frequent basis to set up recheck appointments, ensure medications are being given properly with food and in the morning, um, and answer any questions the clients may have along the way. Use, utilize open-ended questions with the clients to help ensure that they un truly understand the disease process. Now let's take a look so, uh, and take some time to review some common questions that come up about Vedderal and use some case examples to demonstrate some of the answers. So one of the most frequent questions that comes up, um, should I put my patient on once a daily or twice a day therapy? Given that clients are less likely to be compliant with twice daily therapy than once daily therapy long term wise, let's initially default to once daily and increase dosing intervals when indicated. Our first case is a 25 pound terrier who starts at a little over one milligram per pound dose and arrives two weeks later for a recheck. 
We perform an ACTH stim and a pre-stim cortisol value is 6.7 with the stim up to 18, which is above our recommended target range. What do these results mean? You know, are they good or are they bad? What questions should we be asking that might help us make some decisions about this patient? Well, the most important question we should ask is, how is the patient doing clinically? We never maintain a dose or increase a dose based on a number in isolation. Always know how the dog is doing clinically. But if the cortisol is less than 1.45 micrograms per deciliter, this is the exception to the rule. Decrease the dose no matter how the dog is acting. The next step in determining if your results are good or bad, we have to look at other key factors beyond clinical results that could affect the ACTH stim results. First of all, timing of the administration of the pill. Remember our effects Veteral has on cortisol over 24 hours. If the client switched to giving the pill at night, was this because uh, this was easier to remember for them, your, res not, your results are not telling you Veteral's peak effect on cortisol. Absorption is greatly enhanced by food. If the pet was fasted that morning, the cortisol levels will be affected. Clients should give this pill with a small meal. Is the owner actually able to give the medication? Sometimes their best laid plans don't work so well. Pets can sometimes spit out pills or hide from owners so they, can't, they don't have to take the medications. Are the owners following your administration instructions or have they changed based on reading something on the internet or talking to their neighbors? Well, in this case, the owner reported the dog was clinically improving. They were able to give the medications. It was being given in the morning with food. Given that the electrolytes are normal and the clinical improvement, we elected to keep the dose the same and schedule the next recheck at two weeks. At the next recheck, the dog had continued to improve and the ACTH stim was within normal target range and the next recheck was scheduled for three months. Our second case is a 35-pound mixed breed dog who was started on just under one milligram per pound once daily with food. He was making clinical improvement at his two-week check, and by his four-week check, his ACTH stim was within our target range, and the dog was continuing to improve clinically, and so he was left at his 30 milligram once-a-day dose with a recheck scheduled for three months. But the owner called about two months into treatment and reported that while they were overly, generally happy about things, there was still PU, PD, panting um, still occurring in the evenings, um, and so the dog was brought in for another recheck. ACTH stimulation was actually within our target range, but the clinical signs were not being controlled, so we needed to consider increasing our dose frequency, and that was our recommendation. Keep in mind that we want to utilize whole size capsules, um, and so what are our options to increase the dose to twice daily? There's actually a couple options to consider. We could move to 10 milligrams twice a day, um, and soon we'll have a 5 milligram tablet to add to that, so we could make it 15 twice a day, but that would require using four capsules, a 10 and a 15, to achieve that 15 milligrams twice a day. You could also continue to 30 milligrams in the morning, uh, since our ACTH stim is looking good at this dose, and just add 10 milligrams at night. You don't have to do equal dosing. In this case, we chose to continue to 30 milligrams in the morning and just add the 10 milligrams in the PM. After the tree check, uh, after uh, another recheck was scheduled for two weeks, um, as we do with any dose adjustment, and the dog was doing great at that time, so this dose would continue, and the next scheduled recheck was for three months. The next case is a 62-pound Dalmatian who had an adrenal mass. He was started on 60 milligrams, less than one milligram per pound, and he came in for a recheck in two weeks. The owner was not happy with his clinical progress. He was still seeing PUPD with frequent accidents at night. The ACTH stim was actually beautiful. It's right in the middle of our target range at 4.2. Um, are we actually happy with the results, or do we need to consider something different in this patient? Well, in this case, because we aren't controlling our clinical signs, which is how we're monitoring and managing these patients with this current plan, we need to do something different. And that means increasing our dosing interval to twice a day versus once a day. Given that this ACTH stem looks great, we, and, but we aren't controlling the signs, this is a case that splitting the dose is more likely to be helpful, and that's what was done. He was moved to 30 milligrams twice daily. He was scheduled for a recheck in two weeks, and the clients were now happy with improvement in clinical signs. The ACTH continued to be within our normal target range, and his next recheck was scheduled for three months. So why can we utilize Veteral once daily? Well, the top line represents the more or less continuous level of hypercortisolemia if the dog was were, were untreated. And the shaded area represents the uh, quantity of steroid exposure that is being removed each day by the treatment with Veteral. By not completely eliminated, the, quality, the quantity of excessive cortisol exposure is significantly reduced so that clinical signs resolve in most dogs. 
the majority of dogs without concurrent diabetes mellitus do well on once a day dosing. However, there are a real minority of dogs, who, who about 20%, who do better on twice a day dosing. In these dogs, the rise of cortisol levels in the evening results in the continuation of clinical signs, and these dogs need BID therapy. So consider twice day dosing if the clinical signs are controlled during the day but seem to reappear in the evening or at night, as seen in our second case. Or, like in our third case, if the clinical signs are not improving but the ACTH stim is still within our target range, the patient's daily dose should be divided and half given in the morning and half in the evening. There are many diabetic patients who appear to have better insulin regulation when Veteral is administered BID, so many internists do recommend twice-day therapy for these cases. In just a couple of moments, I'll say a little bit more about these diabetic patients. When adjusting from once a day to twice a day treatment schedule, keep in mind our dosage range is still one to three milligrams per pound per day. We want to continue using whole capsules and we don't, because we don't want human exposure to this drug um, by opening up these capsules. In some cases, simply to divide the dose into equal parts, morning and evening, will be effective. In other cases, using combinations of caps, capsules to slowly increase the dose, uh, like we did in our second case, where we did the 30 milligrams to 10 milligrams, and then just added the 10 milligrams. You do need to recheck your um, ACTH stimulations 10 to 14 days after any dose adjustment and monitor for signs of oversuppression, uh, which would show an ACTH stim less than 1.45 or sodium potassium ratios below normal. So the presence of diabetes mellitus and Cushing's together requires specific, or, you know, it's very specific and, and careful monitoring. Veteral can be used successfully, but veterinary endocrinologists or a DEC or technical services ideally should be consulted because these are complicated cases. Keep in mind that unstable diabetics will be positive on the ACTH stim and low dose DEX. Uh, if the patient presents as a diabetic with positive results on your Cushing's test, stabilize diabetes for at least a month first. Um, diabetes and Cushing's are often concurrent illnesses in canine patients, so this is not necessarily unusual to see. Typically, we do diagnose the, the diabetes first, and then we become suspicious of the Cushing's when then we have difficulty regulating them and we, it requires high doses of insulin. Once the Cushing's is diagnosed and the veter veteral therapy is started, we do decrease our current insulin dose by at least 50% or go back to our original starting dose. Federal um, is often used BID twice a day in these patients to maintain a more consistent or con constant cortisol control. And I do um, recommend hospitalizing these guys so that we can monitor them very closely. So another common question is, what do I do if the dog on Veteral has increased potassium but no other problems? Well, the answer is that we have to consider really all the causes. Since we know Veteral decreases aldosterone production, we should consider this first. It is unusual to see this in most of our patients, um, as the current doses used to control glucocorticoid production uh, typically don't drop uh, the aldosterone enough to create a problem. But as long as potassium stays below 6 millimoles per liter, a no dose adjustment is needed. If though it goes above the 6, then dose decreases will be needed. We do have to be careful of concurrent drug use with Federal. Trilosane inhibits aldosterone production, as we know. ACE inhibitors also inhibit the signal to produce aldosterone, and potassium can elevate with their use. ACE inhibitors like benazepril and enalapril are often used in the treatment of cardiovascular disease and for protein-losing nephropathies, and these drugs should be avoided when treating uh, patients with Federal. Potassium-sparing diuretics like spironolactone competitively inhibit aldosterone receptors and are contraindicated when treating with Federal. Sometimes elevations can be seen as a sampling area, especially uh, when cases are prone to thrombosis, as with many of our hyperadrenal cortisone patients. So be sure to evaluate coagulation status in these patients and consider anticoagulant therapy. Our next case is a 50-pound uh, mixed-breed dog who started on just over one milligram per pound of Veteral in the morning with food and presented for his two-week evaluation. His ACTH stim was actually low normal at 1.5. And is this good or bad? Do we need a dose adjustment? If so, how? Well, we need to first of all know how the pet is doing. What are his clinical signs? Is he walking and wagging his tail feeling great or is he feeling putsy or is he totally down and out? And what do we need to, um, what else do we really need to know? We, it's imperative that we know. Uh, well, we need to know what his electrolytes are doing. 
So if the honor reports weakness, lethargy, anorexia, vomiting, or one of the two um, things could be going on. We could have a glucocorticoid deficiency or glucocorticoid withdrawal syndrome, uh, which you often see abdominal cramping, hypoglycemia, weight loss, inability to respond to stress. And this usually occurs within seven to 10 days of starting our veteral therapy. The other thing we can see is, is a mineral allocorticoid deficiency um, or the pet heading towards an adrenal, an Addisonian crisis. And it's imperative to differentiate between these two, and typically your electrolytes will tell you which uh, direction the dog is heading and determine our treatment plan for us. How we differentiate um, this is by our clinical signs and the electrolytes, particularly sodium, potassium, and their ratio. Cortisol withdrawal syndrome patients usually respond by simply discontinuing the veteral for seven days or so um, and then restarting at a lower dose. In the rare event of an Addisonian crisis, we do have to stop the veteral institute immediate symptomatic supportive therapy as required and may include you know, fluid therapy, glucocorticoid replacement therapy, and mineral allocorticoid replacement therapy. When clinical signs of Cushing's reappear, then an ACTH stim should be run and veteral therapy restarted at a lower dose if needed. And this guy, he actually came in feeling pretty darn great. Uh, he was wagging his tail. His electrolytes were normal. And so we just stopped his veteral for seven to ten days. We repeated some blood work, and he started on 30 milligrams once a day, and he just he did fine on half the dose. And you will see a trend where your larger dogs tend to take lower doses than your smaller dogs. So keep that in the back of your mind. So what about the ALKFOS? If we um, are seeming to improve clinically and ACTH stim is acceptable, uh, why would ALKFOS stay elevated or increased? Well, again, we've got to look for the cause, and really ultrasound is our key here. We want to ultrasound the liver as our first step in determining if it's significant or not. It's important to remember that cortisol drives vacuolar changes in the hepatocytes in most dogs, and it simply indicates some sort of hepatocyte congestion. Um, so it's actually unusual for ALKFOS to return to normal. On the other hand, ALT is a leakage enzyme and indicates hepatocellular injury, and continued increases here are more important. So watch that um, enzyme more carefully. Ultrasound can really uh, reveal liver masses or masses with the gallbladder um, or, ma or multiple masses and gallbladder mucosils. And it's important to remember that dogs with hyperadrenal cortisism are actually at increased risk of developing uh, gallbladder mucosils. So case five is a 12-year-old Bichon with a six-month history of gallbladder mucosal, elevated blood pressure, PUPD, urinary accidents, elevated liver enzymes. And she was medically treated with denimerin or SAMI, ursodiol, benazapril, with little to no improvement. So an ACTH stim was performed and she was diagnosed with Cushing's and started on around 5 milli or 0.5 milligram per pound of veteral once a day. So what drug uh, should she be discontinued before starting the veteral in this patient? If you're thinking benazapril, you're correct, as this is an ACE inhibitor and it's contraindicated. Unfortunately, two days later, she started vomiting and became anorectic, so the veteral was discontinued. The following day, she was thought to be painful and an abdominal ultrasound was performed, revealing that she did have a ruptured gallbladder with diffuse bile peritonitis. So sometimes the deck is stacked against some of our patients. The risk of jumping into surgery prior to managing Cushing's puts them at risk of compromised post-surgical healing, increase of pulmonary thromboembolism, and post-operative infections. But in some cases, the risk of waiting for surgery may be greater. It's hard to know what in this case would have been the best course of action, as either option carried significant risks. Our last question is, what factors should be considered if a dog is not responding to veteral as expected? Well, first we have to define what not responding actually means. If we have an ACTH stim that is above our target range, and that's what we mean by we're not responding, then we need to ensure that the medications are be given with food and in the morning as we discussed in the first case example. If they are, then we need to consider the source of our ACTH. Is it the compounded gel? We want it uh, to switch to an FDA-approved product as results from the compounded ACTH gel tend to be inconsistent, and no data is better than bad data. Next, we need to determine the vet, if the dog is actually on veteral, the FDA-approved product, or taking compounded trilostane. If the dog is on veteral and receiving, an, uh, receiving as appropriate, then slowly increasing the dose is what you need to do.
So why does compounding trilostane or compounded trilostane make a difference? Well, first consider in order to obtain FDA approval, drug companies must prove consistency of strength, quality, dissolution, along with safety and efficacy. DECRA has a great veterinary technical services team to assist you with diagnosis, treatment, and monitoring questions. So if you're having problems, you can call us up and ask for help. When using compounded products, on the other hand, the veterinarian is in charge of ensuring safety, efficacy, and quality of the drug, and not the pharmacist or the pharmacy. And you really have no technical support uh, to help you out there. Secondly, there's an excellent study published in 2012 by Audrey Cook at Texas A&M that evaluated 96 batches of compounded trilostane from eight compounding pharmacies. 38% of the compounded batches were below acceptable criteria for content. In fact, um, the average percentage label claim for each batch ranged from anywhere from 39% to 152.6%. 20% or 19 of 96 batches of, compounded ba uh, of these compounded batches failed to meet dissolution criteria. In other words, the capsules and the active ingredient contained within the capsules would have been less available for absorption by the patient. We commonly hear about veterinarians' frustrations with managing dogs on compounded trilostanes, as sometimes they are over-suppressed, others under, and yet others they fall into the target range. And this varies from recheck to recheck, um, and they are constantly adjusting the dosage, which actually ends up costing the client more money with all the rechecks. And this study explains why. It also showed that the same pharmacies, uh, when asked to recompound Veteral, the FDA-approved product, into various sizes, the resulting product did meet all acceptable criteria. The trilostane used to manufacture Veteral has quality and production standards in place to ensure consistency of the product. The trilostane used for compounding does not. The study concluded that on the basis of these findings, compounded trilostane products should be used with caution as they may jeopardize the management of dogs with hyperadrenocorticism and potentially impact safety. And, is it our, and as we saw in our second and third cases, um, we found that ACTH stims are within normal target ranges, but the client still reported clinical signs. Uh, these patients need to have increasing dose intervals to twice daily. And if the concern is that we still have PUPD evidence, it's important to rule out other causes, as we've mentioned earlier, such as urinary tract infections. But these patients can go on to develop diabetes secondary, um, or they can even have diabetes insipidus. Um, in fact, diabetes insipidus is pretty common to see in patients with pituitary macroabnomas. It is worth mentioning that um, we do have sometimes neurological signs. Uh, they are very uncommon to find at the time of tr presentation, but they may develop during the initial treatment of pituitary-dependent hyperadrenal cortisism with both trilostane or mitotane. And it's usually associated with, with macroadenomas. Clinical signs are likely due to removal of the negative feedback inhibition of cortisol on the pituitary and hypothalamic regions. This allows some pituitary tumors to enlarge rapidly, causing edema and increased intracranial pressure. And keep in mind, we're also removing the natural anti-inflammatory edema control associated with glucocorticoids. Clinical signs include depression, disorientation, ataxia, wondering, loss of learned behavior, blindness, seizures, anisocoria, anorexia, head pressing, and circling. And as I mentioned, concurrent diabetes, central diabetes and cispidus can be present. When cortisol levels are normalized, the underlying diseases may be unmasked. Anything that's typically controlled with glucocorticoids can all of a sudden be unmasked. For example, the clinical signs associated with osteoarthritis and allergic skin disease may become more apparent uh, to the owner. Fortunately, only ACE inhibitors and potassium-sparing diuretics are contraindicated with Federal due to the chance of increasing potassium levels, and we already discussed that. And finally, as with all drugs, side effects may occur. In field studies and post-operative experience, the most common side effects reported were anorexia, lethargy, depression, vomiting, diarrhea, elevated liver enzymes, elevated potassium with or without elevated sodium, elevated BUN, decreasing sodium-potassium ratio, hypoadrenocorticism, weakness, elevated creatinine, shaking, renal insufficiency, and in some cases, death has been reported as an outcome of these adverse events. We do have contraindications you should be aware of. Uh, some patients do have hypersensitivity to veteral. They'll vomit or have diarrhea. You try to stop it, start it again. Uh, they'll have other hypersensitivity-type reactions, and they're dogs who need other treatment options. <laughs>
because Vadaril is uh, metabolized and cleared by the hepatic and renal systems, it's contraindicated in pets who have primary her hepatic or renal disease. We do have to remember we're affecting the sex hormones, and so it is contraindicated to use in pregnant or nursing or breeding animals, and we absolutely do not want to have human exposure, so do not open or divide these capsules. Um, the label um, does have a caution for pets who are less than three kilograms. FDA required we put this on our label because our FDA trial uh, did not have any patients who were under three kilograms in the trial. Adrenal necrosis has been seen. Um, it is rare side effect of trilostane, and it was seen in less than 2% of the dogs in the clinical tri trial and far less since the launch, and we've done the post-monitoring. It is important to remember that lysadrine is cytolytic, and its mode of action is irreversibly destroying this adrenal gland. Um, it is very rarely, as I mentioned, seen with veteral, and it's actually believed not to be a direct uh, action of the veteral itself, um, but there are references to support that it's an ACTH toxicity versus veteral activity. Um, and although this side effect is rare, it, under it underscores the need for diligent monitoring in our patients. We do have multiple support materials available from DECRA. Um, the algorithm I already showed you earlier, and it's here again. We have the technical brochures as well as client brochures. So please reach out to us to discuss your cases or get any materials that you need to support you um, in your clinical practice. And just some final take-home points. It's important to make sure we get our diagnosis right. We don't want to treat a patient if they're not symptomatic. We need to start at the low end of the dose range once a day with food, preferably in the morning. Never miss that early monitoring. We want to catch patients who are oversuppressed before they have a crisis. Um, if you change the dose, um, typically don't change it at that two-week mark. Wait until you have your 30-day test so that we've had a chance for Vedaril to really have its maximum effect and see where we need to take that dose. We can see oversuppression and glutocorticoid withdrawal um, are the most common uh, consequences of that versus actually having an Addisonian crisis. But be aware that we do have some long-term dose changes, especially it seems like the pets get out about two years, um, and we often have dose decreases around that two-year mark. We do have additional vet, um, resources for you. Um, as with any FDA-approved drug, you do have a package insert that goes to the safety trials, the pharmacokinetics, um, and so it's nice that you can have that as a reference. We have a very good technical services team. Dosha and Teresa are two CVTs that probably know more about Cushing's disease than a lot of us veterinarians because they talk about it so much, as well as four veterinarians on staff to support um, you, uh, the clinicians as you are working through cases. That's also the number that you call if you do have an adverse or unexpected um, event associated with federal, and we appreciate you taking the time to let us know about that. Um, we are required to um, submit that information to FDA, and it helps us um, improve our label um, and information to you as practitioners. We do have an online um, CE available on hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, and hyperadrenal cortisism, um, so please utilize that uh, for some good um, additional CE available. Again, I mentioned the technical brochures. Um, Mark Peterson does have an excellent blog that we refer people to. It actually uh, goes through how do you um, actually um, dilute out and save and aliquot your ACTH to make it last for six months. He also does have a discussion around that one microgram per kilogram ACTH stem dosing, so you can read further about that if you want. Please utilize your local deck or sales managers for some brochures, um, and you can find some other great information on our website. And thank you, that's what I have for you. And this is Bo who, um, and his brother Cody um, and what he looked like seven months later um, after he uh, was on Vedral. So appreciate you taking the time. All right, thanks so much, Dr. Engler. This has been very informative. We do have a few questions, um, and those of you that, that still have questions, please send them on over. We've got about 20 minutes here where we can answer them. Um, so let's start with uh, Stephanie has a question. Um, oh, nope, that one we already did earlier. Um, Karen, no, here we go. Nancy has a question. Um, she wants to know, will Pomeranians have sex hormone abnor abnormalities after spaying? I don't have a good answer to that question. I, you know, any, any pet we spay, we're obviously changing their... Um, their sex hormones and removing those. Just because we spay a dog, though, we should not expect a Pomeranian or any dog to develop um, atypical Cushing's. 
Okay. Um, Ashley wants to know, what are some of the reasons renal failure may be seen with Cushing's? Uh, we typically don't see overt renal failure, um, but we do know that these guys have, uh, many of the pets will develop a protein losing nephropathy, and over time, um, if GFR, glomerular filtration rate, is measured, we do see a decreasing glomerular filtration rate, um, so they have renal insufficiency, but it is very rare to have true overt renal failure. Um, if you're seeing that, it's probably from some other secondary effect, whether that's hypertension or something else. All right. Um, John wants to know, he says, there are published articles that recommend starting Vetteral twice daily. Why do you suggest starting it just once a day? Yeah, um, yeah. the initial studies for the FDA approval of Vetteral, we did use the once a day treatment to prove efficacy. Um, and approximately four out of five dogs will have their clinical signs controlled with once a day treatment. Um, plus you're likely to see higher compliance with the once a day. Um, but twice a day therapy is not off label. So, uh, you know, if that is what the patient needs, they can do that. But we found in our trial and post monitoring that only about 20% of patients need twice a day to control their clinical signs. All right. Um, Jordan asks, if cost is an issue, can I just use a baseline cortisol to measure my patient after starting Vetteral? Well, our FDA trials for treatment and monitoring were based on using the ACTH stimulation, stimulation test to evaluate the patient's response. Baseline cortisols, when used alone to monitor Vetteral treatment, have the inherent drawback of not being able to fully assess the adrenal cortical reserve capacity um, of dogs um, who can be close to being oversuppressed. Dr. Audrey Cook did publish a paper in JAVMA in 2010 using baseline cortisol that I would refer you to if you want to look at alternative monitoring parameters. And you can call DEC or Veterinary Technical Services if you would like to uh, further discuss monitoring techniques and find the findings of Dr. Cook's study. Um, we've had a few people who have said, thank you, this has been very informative. And we have one more question. Um, many owners don't want to treat Cushing's because it is not immediately life-threatening. What can I say to them to get them to comply with my recommendation to treat? Well, clinical signs associated with Cushing's, as we kind of mentioned earlier, is that it often results in patients being euthanized or moved to outdoors because those clinical signs are driving the clients insane. Uh, treatment of Cushing improves that quality of life for the pet and the owner by controlling most, if not all, of those clinical signs associated with Cushing's. We also have to remember there are secondary factors such as the hypertension, the protein losing nephropathies, diabetes, thromboemboli, gallbladder, mucoceles that we're not able to control or prevent without managing those cortisol levels. Um, and you know, for dogs who only have the hair loss signs, you know, those dogs um, with Cushing syndromes, um, you know, sometimes again they go on to develop other uh, consequences other than those visible cosmetics. And so, even though we don't entirely understand that some of those atypical Cushings, uh, we really need to monitor them very carefully every three months and ensure that they convert, uh, if they convert to the full-blown Cushing syndromes, that you know we we treat them to improve quality of life and and prevent those secondary changes from happening. Uh, we just had another question come through. Ashley would like to know, what are some of the ill effects of using lysadrin? Well, you know, uh, our, you know, as DECRA, we have, be, having an FDA-approved drug, we have the safety um, and efficacy trials and the, pharmacon and the pharmacokinetics associated with that. Um, you know, we, there are no studies that I'm aware of that truly go through the safety and efficacy associated with lysodrine. We have only the anecdotal and, and clinical experience of practitioners through the years. Uh, because it's not an FDA trial drug, we don't have a product, a product insert in the species that we're using it in. So I really can't comment to the adverse events or the safety and efficacy of lysodrine as a whole um, other than anecdotal you know, practitioner experience. All right. Well, Dr. Engler, thank you so much for your expert insights. I am certain that everyone in attendance has learned quite a bit today. Um, for those of you interested in receiving the continuing education hours, there will be a brief survey that pops up at, when you exit the webinar. Please complete every field on that form, and you can expect to receive your certificate in about two weeks. If for some reason we had some people in the last webinar that the survey did not come up for properly, so if that happens, um, please send an email to webmarketing at henryshinevet.com and we'll make sure that 
uh, we get the information from you that we need to get you your certificate. So that email again was webmarketing at henryshinevet.com and that's only if the survey doesn't come up. If the survey comes up for you, which it should, um, just simply complete it and you'll get your certificate via email in about two weeks. We had a few people question, um, ask the question, would they be able to get the slides from this PowerPoint? Um, and Dr. Engler has made arrangements to get those slides out to you. Those will come um, either next week or the week after. Uh, she has a little bit of cleanup to do on those before we send them to you. Um, so if you're interested in those, those will be available. Um, thank you so much for your participation and interest. This ends our webinar presentation.